Welcome everyone to Mail Fuzz TV. I am Peter, that is Connor, and we are going to talk about Star Trek Deep Space Nine Season 1 Episode 5 it is called Captive Pursuit. So full spoilers for the episode as always. Uh, notably, this is the first one after Next Gen has come back. We just did a Next Gen episode, so uh, uh, yes, we're in, we're in the cycle. So, you know, we're in the, the great crossing back and forth uh, between the streams. Uh, but uh, this episode is an O'Brien-focused episode, uh, which, you know, not surprising. We kind of expected a lot of these early episodes to sort of dance around the, the different characters. Uh, this is about an alien who comes through the wormhole uh, from the other side. So this is a, a Gamma Quadrant native, if you will, uh, who goes by the name of Tosk. Uh, he's very nervous about coming onto the station. He doesn't really want help, but he kind of has to because the ship's going to blow up. He's in... Uh, so they bring him in, and it's O'Brien who goes to him to try and calm him down, try and find out why he's in such a rush, what he's hiding, and help with his ship. Uh, and from there, there's kind of some stuff revealed about, you know, why he was running, who's chasing him, that kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, and maybe some, uh, you know, some shades of grey decisions made about how to deal with the situation by the end of the episode. Very uh, off-the-books decisions. Yes, uh, they play a little bit coy with it. Uh, how did you feel about Captive Pursuit? Yeah, I, I quite like this one. Um, I thought, especially the the back half where we kind of had some context for what was happening and the uh, the chase was kind of you know going on. I thought that was really solid stuff. Yeah, I like this one too. It, it's kind of it's a kind of a sweet episode by the end uh, because of like the choices O'Brien makes and like his like kind of friendship that he forms with this alien. Um, I also appreciate that the first half, you know, before the, the actual hunters show up and we get kind of some more context, is that it's kind of important in establishing some of what that friendship is, even though it's, you know, it's a bit weird, it's, a, it's, a, it's an odd friendship because they can barely communicate, you know, Tosk is, isn't really open with information, doesn't understand a lot of things that's been said to him, but... It, it reminded me a lot of the, uh, the Next Gen episode with uh, Geordie and the... Uh... The, the Borg. Mm, a little bit, yeah. You. Yeah. yeah. Uh, who's not, obviously, this guy, you know, Tost never seems as dangerous. Obviously, there's some hints that he could become dangerous because he's trying to, like, find the weapons on the station, but other than that, there's, there's very little about him that's intimidating. He's very, uh, just wants to mind his own business and leave as quickly as possible. Uh, but, you know, O'Brien's trying to get him to open up. He tries to take him to, to Quark's and uh, has a drink, and but, of course, this is weird to him. Um, which actually, I'll, I'll just mention this now since it's kind of separate from everything else, but Quark's, like, desire to be the classic bartender who, like, listens to people's problems. But you know what uh, to call him a bartender. Or barkeep was the, the phrase he didn't yes. like, yes. Although O'Brien, like, made a Insist. point of saying it every time. Um, I kind of love that, it's, it's the way, so when O'Brien's upset about what's happening with, with, uh, with Tosk and all that, uh, he... He's sitting there and he's miserable, and Quark cracks a joke and goes, the missus again? He's like, what do you mean by that? <laughs> As if, you know, Hemi and Keiko have a lot of problems. But it's the way that he hobbles around, hobbles around like the others. He's, he's like, when he realizes a story here, he's like, oh. And he, he sort of hops around the, the, the bar and like hops up in the little stool and he's like, go on. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's like after they leave, and he's been so, you know, in, in, demanding that he's not a barkeep he doesn't he's not there to listen to all the problems he is a, you know a proprietor of goods and as soon as they go he hops over to another table like so tell me your problems friend <laughs> it's just, I, I don't know quark is fast becoming my favorite character on the show joe is funny joe is funny about this is i'm realizing that the performance that armin shimmerman is given here is obviously less principal snyder right because he's a very yeah, different character yeah. but what is like what it's closer to is the teenage version of Principal Snyder in the episode of Buffy where they all become uh, teenagers again? They all start acting like teenagers. That's what he's reminded me of. This glee in his face as he like gets excited. <laughs> That's what I'm getting from Quark. <laughs> um, Quark's kind of great, and I wasn't expecting that. And like I say, it's kind of becoming my favorite. Mm. Yeah, so, yeah, he was, he was there to this episode in these small doses. Um, but yeah, so yeah, Brian gets some good time here. He gets to have the, be the one with the moral decision to make. Uh, we we learn throughout the episode, you know, like, okay, so he's called Tosk, but is that his race? Is that his species? 
is that his name? Like, you know, like what exactly is the kind of by the end it seems it's his his role. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he kind of doesn't really have like context for all these interpretations because he's he's you know we so we find out he's bred for for the hunt, right? So he's effectively bred for these like other aliens who are smarter who have designed him you know in a lab or whatever and all he wants his entire purpose is to run out smart and get away from the hunters as best he can as long as he can for as long as he can and then die a glorious death and that's what he sees honor and he sees honor and dying this glorious death um so and there's great shame in being captured alive uh and, so and being toss isn't a name as such it's it's kind of what he is you know being that that prey is being a tosk yeah, but he doesn't. But therefore, he doesn't have a name. So that may as well be his name too. So it, it's what yeah. we're gonna call him. It's what everyone yeah. else calls him. But yeah, just for the full context. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff early on with him. Like he's really anxious to get his ship fixed, and O'Brien's like, "It's okay. It's okay. It'll, like, it'll take a couple of days. We left for the, the the core to cool down, and we need to replicate these bits that we don't have because they're from the other side of the universe, and we don't know." Once we, we, we take one out, I, I figured out how it works. We'll take one out, we'll, we'll feed it in, and you know, we'll, we'll print some new ones. Don't worry about it. Uh, but of course, you know, because the, everyone knows he's lying about something, he's not being completely truthful. You know, it's like, okay, fine. Uh, Cisco says, you know, Odo, keep an eye on him as well. So we get, you know, this is becoming a classic scene in this show now, is like, characters doing something, then the camera pans over to a, an object, and then it liquefies, and it's like, aha! <laughs> <laughs> gotcha Odo's on the pearl uh, but you try to get into the weapons area of the station and try to override things so they arrest them and but Brian's like yeah obviously it's not good that he was doing this but like I still don't think he means his harm like there's just he's just got this gut feeling that he's not actually going to do anything bad to them and he goes to speak to him in the cell and tries to talk to him and it's uh, you know the hunters eventually show up and come through the, the wormhole uh, and the lead alien here, he's visibly unrecognizable, but Garrett Graham's actually the main one who talks. I could hear really? his voice, but uh, okay. um, even though it was him, I couldn't see it in the face. Uh, like, the makeup job's just so, you know, heavy. Intense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we get this, because this, they're all wearing these red spacesuits with big silver helmets, and they're, we get a big action sequence on the, the promenade where they're all kind of firing phasers at each other. Uh, hiding behind walls and all the rest of it until things, you know, eventually calm down. Um, and it becomes this thing where, you know, Cisco talks to him and it's like, well, he doesn't approve, obviously, that they have this thing, this hunt, where they, they hunt a sentient being. It's kind of cruel. You breed this this being just for this purpose. That's really sad and, and vicious. Um, and he's it's just... not his place to interfere with their culture, ultimately. Ultimately, yeah. And the hunter's like, well, fine. Like, We'll say the wormholes off limits now. For you know, when we're doing this hunt, they're not allowed to go through there, so it always stays on our side of space. It's like okay, I guess I have to accept that in some level. Um, but you know, he walks out and talks to the rest of them, and like you know, Brian especially is quite concerned, and you know, he says, "But what if he seeks asylum? Like, what if he asks for protection? At that point, like it's different, right? Because we're not just interfering. This is like someone asking us. This is a sentient being asking for protection." So O'Brien runs down, like, quite gleefully, like, to, to the cells to, to, to say, hey, like, we can help you. All you have to do is ask for it. And he does that thing in his performance at uh, uh, Tosk where every time he says the word asylum, it sounds like a word that's so alien to him that he's never heard before. He's like, asylum. You know, he sort of yeah, says it in a weird... really breaks help. Yeah. Uh, and he wouldn't do it because it is, you know, it's his duty, it's his honor. So everything he knows and he's every fiber of his being is to go in this, this chase... Um, and even though he's not going to go to do it properly like he's supposed to, because now that he's been held captive here, uh, he's going to be brought in alive, which means instead of being killed in a glorious death, he'll be put in a cage and mocked for the rest of his life, which is, you know, a horrible existence. And, like, O'Brien's like, but you want that? You want to go back to that? Uh, and, you know, sure enough, O'Brien thinks up of something else. Uh, and it's kind of a genius little loophole in a weird way, because... The hunters also want this chase. They're disappointed that it's this easy. They they want the the big glorious chase across space to, to for their prey, and O'Brien takes off his badge, uh, breaks you know because he, he comes out and says he's going to he's there under Cisco's order to escort uh the, the prisoner and the hunter back to the ship, and 
takes the prisoner. He, you know, he overloads one of the the, the uh, force fields to to shock the hunter. Uh, takes toss. They go, you know, rummaging through the the, the ducks and things. Uh, eventually get to his ship. Uh, but the real heart of it, you know, comes from a couple of key moments. It's uh, when you know Odo's like aware this is happening, and he's like pissed, and he goes to Cisco, and I, I'm shutting this down right now. Yeah, and Cisco realizes what's going on. And he's like, yeah, you could put, put up some barriers, and it'll stop them in the tracks. And Odo's walking off, and Cisco just goes, "Hey, uh, Odo, no rush." Stay <laughs> tuned. And I, what I loved about it is there's a, a nod from Odo where he kind of understands. And then we actually stay on him for the rest of the, the walk because he actually intentionally walks slowly <laughs> up up to the, the, the transporter. Oh, yeah, it turns right. And I was like, it's like instead of just doing something else for five minutes, he, he just I'll do it, I'll do it. I'll literally do it slowly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, kind of great. You know, it's this this thing where Cisco's making this conscious choice where he understands what's happening and that in some level he thinks it's the, the morally correct thing to to let Toss get away. Uh, Even though he can't acknowledge that publicly. You know, in fact, he has to, you know, grill and chew out O'Brien for it. He has to tell him what he did was, was a, you know, a, a betrayal of orders. It betrayed the Prime Directive. And if anything like that happens again, he'll he'll be, you know, fired, basically. And, of course, O'Brien's not an idiot. And he turns and says, you know, like, when we were on oh, our we way to the ship... Cool. Yeah, we had tons of time. Like you had tons of time. Once you realized what was going on, you could have blocked us off at multiple points. And he's like, huh, I guess that got by us then. And it's just this little moment of like, I know you approve. We can't say it to each other, but I know you approve. Yeah. And I like that there's also <laughs> like a little moment of defense as well, in terms of not just that it was the right thing to do morally. But mm. also, hey, no, well, this gives us some good relations. This is what Toss wanted, this is what the hunters wanted. You know, everyone wins out of this scenario, even even if it was, officially speaking, breaking some rules on our side. Yeah, some technicalities at play, for sure, but uh, you get a little smile from Cisco at the end, so he's happy with the outcome. Uh, and everyone, you know, is kind of on board with it, by and large. But there was a lot of good O'Brien moments in this, you know, I love, uh, like, his moments of trying to, like, get him, get him tossed to open up are all generally quite entertaining. Uh, when Tosk is leaving on his ship, he says, would you like to come with me? And O'Brien's like, ah, no, I, I think, uh, you know, the, the wife and the child might uh, not enjoy the life of being on the run forever. Uh, so, maybe not. But, you know, he's earned maybe this... Maybe one day. Yeah, but he's earned this being's respect. You know, Tusk, you know, what it he says to him, you know, die with honour, because that's like a, you know, a genuine like thing coming from him, so he says it back. Yeah. He's like, Tusk, die with honour. So, we get a sweet ending, uh, and... You know, throughout, and those are good all little tidbits with characters as well. But the, the main plot is, uh, I think, really solid. And you have a nice or insight the into Brian. Main plot we've had yet. That may be true. That may be true. Because uh, it gives O'Brien a lot, of course, in terms of his, like, just empathy and, like, making him. I mean, we already like him, but, like, this is, like, a good chance for him to really shine in this kind of role. Yeah. Um,. You know, Odo had a couple of good moments. Obviously, we mentioned him transforming. Uh, I liked a little like, wrinkle that they've kind of like established here. I mean, obviously, it was already there, but this is the first time it's been vocalized. I think is him not using phasers. Uh, you know, because when the guards, the hunters first show up on the the promenade, and he goes up to like, encounter the first one, he gets you know he's you know he's uh, face punched basically. <laughs> um, he you know is offered a phaser by Kira and says, "No, you know I don't use those." Um, which I think is interesting. We have the head of security that does not use phasers. I'm sure it'll come up as a reason at some point. Like, well, oh, yeah, sure. Story. Yeah, it probably will. Yeah. Um, and obviously he has other ways to to deal with people, no doubt. But um, it is very interesting to just sort of see his quirks and some of his different rules sort of like coming up as we're learning more about him. Yeah, and uh, some of the things I, I appreciate the acknowledgement at last that. Deep Space Nine as a as a station is no longer there to, you know, be part of age or to kind of oversee those things. It is mm. there to kind of just overlook the the wormhole now and defend and observe that. Because obviously that's kind of been an unspoken thing, but this was the first time they kind of actively just said, No, this is kind of what we're here for now. I mean the close enough to Bejure, I still suspect there'll be a lot of uh you know, plots dealing with Bejure, but 
yeah, the, their purpose has changed a little bit. I think what's neat about it as well is because it's this space station that's at, like, the, you know, this new gateway, right? This new terminal point for the universe. It's, like, an easy justification for why so many different and interesting characters are going to be passing through. Because it's the only way to get to this part of the universe now, is through this wormhole. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot, lot of, uh, lot, lot of just good tv setup there i guess in the sense that okay this is natural now for all these things to be happening where some shows you kind of feel like oh isn't it kind of weird how everything goes through this small town <laughs> like this small yeah, town yeah, sometimes you, it feels a little bit contrived yeah. just for the sake of well we've got to have plots happening and you, you let it go because otherwise you know what's the point in watching tv but it's nice when it feels so natural yeah, and obviously, next gen is easy because the Enterprise is moving to the plots, so that's okay. It's going to find the plots, whereas this is a stationary place, so it's more about the uh, plots coming to them. Um, so I, you know, I, I, uh, I dug all that stuff. Um, uh, the other thing I liked in this episode as well is that I noticed that the the door to uh, Tosk ship. It was very different to a lot of the other doors we see in the ships, where it wasn't just moving left to right. It was actually a circular door that kind of spun into place. Mm. Um, it's just a little thing where I don't know if it's a conscious effort to make things feel different from next gen, or if it was a conscious decision to say, oh, this is an alien ship from a different sector that would have completely different design philosophy. I think it was, I think it was more that. Because yeah. uh, it's like while O'Brien was trying to you know, figure out what was wrong with it, it worked on completely different systems. Like mm. He understood the basic premise of it once it was explained because he could liken it to things that he was familiar with. Um, I think it's like it harvested like radiation or something or other and, and kind of, you know, converted it. But it was very alien in terms of using it on a ship. So I, I think it was just meant to feel like, no, 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 everything across that wormhole is very different to what it is here. Yeah, yeah. And it sells that well enough, so that's good. Uh also, as much as we're saying we're enjoying Quark, we do have to point out that the episode opens with one of his employees making a complaint that he writes into their contracts they have to be sexually available to him. At least that's just that was what I was getting from the scene. Yeah. Uh, so, curious to see if there's a follow-up in that and if they deal with that a bit more. Yeah, and, and when, I, when I say I'm enjoying Quark, I think he's a very fun character to have around. And I'm assuming part of the, the course of the show is he's going to develop into a better person. Oh, you know, for sure, yeah. He, he's already not as typical Ferengi as most of the ones that we see. But, you know, you know, he's got that, that friendship rivalry with Odo, for example. But, you know, I can see him softening more and more as the show goes on. I think the thing with uh, the Ferengi thus far, typically, they always try these schemes, but people kind of, like, catch them on their shit, usually. And I suspect, much like this woman here at the start, most... You assume probably say piss off and don't do it. Uh, I, I think this is more just of a thing in modern context with all the big cases in the last few years that it's hard not to think about this a little bit more seriously. Uh, that they're just casually mentioning and this funny character is doing this. Well, Cisco does take it quite seriously. Oh, he does. Yeah, no, he does. So it's not treated as a joke, um, despite him being, you know, a likable and amusing character. Dis despite you know. Yeah. clearly being you know not a good character i, I think that, that's that's kind of what my point is he's enjoyable to watch that doesn't necessarily make him a good person by any means yeah at least for now I, like you say i think over time he might uh develop and, and get better but I, I i do wonder if uh this opening scene is not meant to necessarily feel as heavy as it does to us now i think than probably at the time where it was probably just yeah, he's this sort of scheming little asshole, but you're not supposed to remember it as like a defining character thing, whereas I think it sticks out a bit more to us now. It'll uh, be interesting to see if it's followed up on. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if it will. It may not. This may just be yeah. it. But uh, there was something that stuck out to me a little bit as we were, as I was going through the episode. Uh, but yeah, no, solid fun time. Uh, maybe it's best episode. Uh, I think all, all the other episodes have had really good like character stuff, but I think just in terms of purely the main plot i think this is the strongest since maybe the first one which kind of is the establishing plot so it's a little bit different um but in terms of just uh, as a standalone episode here's you know what we're doing this week i think this was the you know, the, the the most solid that we've had yet yeah did you like the uh the red suits and big helmets that the hunters had yeah obviously <laughs> very doctor who 
Don't Frank up. Don't sully Deep Space Nine with Doctor Who. Deep Space Nine wishes it could be as good as Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> aye, aye, very good. Uh, so that is Captain Pursuit. Uh, next time on Deep Space Nine, uh, we'll be looking at an episode called Culus. Here's, okay. a, here's a description uh, per IMDb. Q, the Enterprise's D's cons- consistent, uh, omnipotent annoyance comes to harass the DS9 crew when his travelling companion, Vash, refuses to travel with Q any longer. We're getting Q and Vash in Deep Space Nine. Oh my. That's interesting. <laughs> oh, Brian's just going to be like, ah, oh, not this shit again. I left the Enterprise to get away from pieces of crap like this. No! <sighs> Yeah, as much as obviously this is going to be a Q episode, we've just had an O'Brien episode. I feel like this is going to be pretty hefty O'Brien as well because he has that past with Q, and he's going to kind of be giving that context to a lot of the other crew. This is definitely, you know, and obviously not counting the first one, which is there to set up with Picard and all that. This is your first proper kind of crossover thing. Um, I mean, mm-hmm. the Klingon sisters obviously had appeared before, so that was a nice little pull. I would say though that Brain and Q for an episode, he's a more established, recurring next-gen If those thing. Klingon sisters never showed up in next-gen, they would have still worked absolutely perfectly fine. Yes, here. whereas this is going to rely no. on the fact, like, we know who this is, O'Brien knows who this is, uh, and I'm, I'm kind of yep. looking forward to Cisco just not putting up with his shit. <laughs> Cisco is... See, seeing the way Cisco handles it compared to Picard is going to be... I think that that's intentionally why they've done this so early. It's mm. It's to really highlight the differences between those two. No, that's um, smart. And it'll that's be smart. To show kind of how differently they handled something like Q, which because it's a you know a one to one comparison. Vash is a surprise. I was not expecting Vash. Mm, me either. <laughs> I was not expecting Vash at all. So uh, we'll see that next time in Deep Space Nine. Next Star Trek episode we review though will be a next gen episode though. So that's what's coming up directly next uh, review wise. So look forward to that. Uh, so yes. That has been Deep Space Nine. Let us know what you thought of this episode in the comments. Like, subscribe, ding the bell for notifications, all that stuff. Uh, you can, of course, support us a couple of different ways. You can you hit the super thanks button on YouTube, or you can go over to patreon.com slash TV and support us monthly over there. Um, and all support does help and is appreciated. Thank you very much. Uh, but yeah, that is us. So thank you once again for watching or listening. We always appreciate it. Keep watching Star Trek and somewhere on Deep Space Nine. How will how will Q handle Odo pretending to be a cowboy hat?